Good morning, family. Glad you are here today uh, to all of you. Uh, glad for those of you that are joining us online uh, as well. And a special welcome to our visitors. Really, uh, especially glad that you're with us today. Hope this is the first of many visits. We would love to fold you into the life of our family. Amen? Amen. We would really love to fold you into the life of our family. Amen? Amen. Thank you. We do want them to know that we love them and we want them to come back, right? We all on board with that idea? Okay. (laughs) Good. Uh, Good. And guess what? I forgot my clicker. Uh, So I apologize for that. Uh, Before we jump in this morning, though, I do want to take a moment uh, to uh, recognize our veterans. I'll tell you what happened. Usually I recognize our veterans the Sunday before Veterans Day, but this week it was Saturday, and so it was like, so I asked several of our veterans, and they said, oh, we don't care, either one. So I said, okay. So uh, I I thought it'd be fun to do it a little closer uh, to the day itself. So if all of our veterans would stand up, please, we would love to recognize those who uh, put themselves in harm's way to protect us. We are so, so thankful for you. Stay standing for just a second. I want to pray for you real quickly. Father God, thank you, uh, literally, Father, for those who have put themselves in harm's way that we might be safe, Father. We are so grateful for them, and I know uh, that many of them pay a price that goes on after they have left the service, Father. So I just pray that you would bless them and encourage them, uh, Father, strengthen them in in these days. And and Father, I I think about our active service personnel as well. We pray that you would watch over them and protect them in this this time of great unrest uh, around, around the world, Father in the Middle East and Ukraine and and all around the world, that you would just watch over them, Father, that they might come back to us to be veterans uh, themselves. Bless them and be glorified in their lives, we pray, and we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So uh, we're in this series, uh, Created for Connection, uh, and it's talking about the importance of connectedness to one another uh, in our spiritual life. But that also overflows into our emotional life and even our physical life. If you remember the opening sermon, I kind of showed you some of the statistics and the, the single, two best single predictors of uh, whether or not you'll live the next uh, 10 years is a connection with a large group of people that are your friends and a group of really, really close, what we call refrigerator friends, right? People who are such good friends, they can just open your refrigerator and take something... You're all going, oh my goodness, I would never do that. This is the Northwest, we don't do that. South, they kind of do that a little bit more. We do have a memory verse. Uh, for those of you, again, that are, are new, we put memory verses with each sermon series because I just think it's important to build the word into people's lives, amen? Okay, so let's read this together. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Um, And so uh, I have a question for you this morning. I want to kind of kick it off uh, and see kind of what your answer is. So uh, next slide. Here's my question. Oops. Next slide. Oh, yep, that's it. What do you think of when you think of the word engagement? Wedding. Wedding. Interaction. Meeting. What? Meeting. Meetings. <laughs> That's the negative connotation. So are none of you like Star Trek fans? <laughs> Pat, Captain Picard, when he started off, when he wanted to go somewhere, he would say, Engage. there you go. You were all holding out on me, weren't you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> Engagement is, is, is a really good word. Uh, I, I, I like it because it kind of gets on to this, this deal that we're going to talk about. And we, we think about it, you know, engagement, a wedding, you know, or, or connection or, or all of those uh, sorts of things. It, it means some sort of involvement with something, not just being a bystander, not just kind of casually going along. You're, you're really in, engaged, if you will, with what's happening. And so uh, the truth of the matter is this, that to build real community It requires engagement on your part. In fact, the cost of real community is engagement. In some sort of of way, it is engagement. Uh, Whether it's, you know, spending time together, uh, doing things for one another, all of those uh, sorts sorts of times uh, requires that that engagement, that commitment. Say engagement. Engagement. Say commitment. commitment. 
All right, that's, that's what we're kind of talking about. And we kind of live in a time where I talk to lots and lots of people who are hungering for community. They'll use the word, I, I just want community. You know, I want to be connected. I want, want those sorts of things. Um, but then like five minutes later in the conversation is, yeah, but I don't want to be tied down. I don't want to really be committed. I want to kind of, you know, and I just want to go, ah! <laughs> because those two, you can't do both. Those are mutually exclusive. If you want real community, if you want real connectedness, uh, you, you have to be committed. And so I, I want to say to folks like that, you have commitment issues, right? I'm not going to ask if you've ever been told if you have commitment issues or not, but, but I, I think we live in a time where everybody has commitment issues, right? We're just so many things going on. It, it's kind of what I call Costco food sample spirituality. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah. yeah. You know, how many of you have been to Costco and done the lap around the thing, you know? It's like, yeah. See, I think you can pretty much have lunch in there if you do it, if you do it right, going around all, all of the things like that. And, and you know, you might kind of get full, but I have real doubts as to whether your real nutritional needs have been met when you do the Costco lap, right? You know? And, and the same is kind of true in this. Everybody wants to kind of have something to eat, but they don't really want the commitment. They want to have some sort of relationship, but they don't really want to kind of put a whole thing into it. They want to keep their options open, um, all, all of that. But here's the truth I know to be, know to be true about all of this. Um, I think we missed one there. Did we get the cost of authentic connection is engagement? There it is, cost of authentic engagement. So um, I want to do two parts. This is kind of a two-part sermon uh, talking about the particulars of how we uh, need to engage, okay? So next slide. Uh, one of the ways you need to in- engagement is time and energy. You cannot have deep friendships without committing time and energy to that friendship. Amen. I mean, someone you spend like a minute a year with, you don't have a deep connection with them. It's, it's just not the way it works. It requires time and, and energy. I, I love the example of Jesus, and this was kind of first century rabbis, of they, they would literally come and follow him around for years. For three years, they'd spent time following Jesus around, and they were undoubtedly deeply connected to one another so much so that they could have fights and survive it, right? They'd go on and and, and be a part of it. And so um, next Sunday, we're going to talk about time and energy because we're going to have our our work and witness team that just got back from Guatemala at like midnight uh, Thursday. Um, And and we're going to celebrate the the connection. You, You cannot have the experience they have, they had, without deep engagement, right? They have given of their time. They spend like tons of hours on an airplane, which is like, oh, you know, uh, they, they're down there working and doing all of those sorts of things. And they're going to come back and you'll probably see the joy of what God has done. Why? Because they connected, they, they engaged with time and, and energy. So that's next week, second part of this. Next slide is money. There's a bunch of you going right now, ah, oh, I could have slept in this morning. It's the money sermon. I just want to say, I don't preach about this a lot. It's been over a year since I preached about it. But this is actually really important when it comes to relationship and when it comes to the body of Christ. Because there, there's this little secret, okay? So shh, don't share this outside the church, but it takes money to be a church. Amen? Amen? We all, I think we, we know that. Uh, God doesn't just supernaturally make money appear in the church bank account, Okay? I've asked several times, and God just doesn't seem to do it that way. It's like, you know, you know, so the, all the things that we enjoy about being, you know, family together re- require resources, turning on the lights, you know, uh, doing the work around here, fixing things, uh, the salaries of, of pastors and the care that comes uh, from that, um, resources, serving our community, all of those things just require, require money. Um, and do you know how all of that happens? You, you transfer money out of your account into the church's account in some way, shape, or form, right? (laughs) Let me think about that a minute, you know? That's that's just the way it works. I'm I'm not trying to pretty this up, or I'm not trying to make it easier. I'm just kind of telling you the truth in, in this. The reality is the church does not have a secret trust fund. 
Okay, it, it just doesn't. And so that brings us to this truth. The church only has what you give. Amen. That's it. What, what you give is what, what we have to spend and, and we budget uh, around that. But let that sink in for a minute. If you all stop giving, the church as you know it will cease. Uh, you know, we, we'll have to give up the building. You know, uh, the staff isn't going to be able to give full time to this. We'll have to go find jobs and, and we won't be able to do things like Easter egg hunts and trick or treats and, and all of those things where we serve our community. The opportunities to reach people for Jesus go way down. No doubt, no doubt. I can tell you if I were to suddenly lose my job because we didn't have the resources anymore, I would start a small group in my church. So maybe 10 or 12 of you would get to be a part of that and that's it. We're done right? So resources are, are what make all of, all of that sort of thing happen. And here's what I know, and this is why we preach about this. Next slide. Giving away money is critical to your spiritual health. Now, I've kind of been talking about the practical implications, but this is the one that really, really matters. It, it, it's critical. Giving away money isn't just about paying for the programs and balancing the books, although that's important as someone who sits on the board and the finance committee and all of those sorts of things. But there is something spiritual that happens in our souls when we give. And I've been walking with the Lord a long time, and I've tested and tried this. When we give our time and energy, and, and when we give our money, there's something spiritual, spiritual. Generosity has a way of expanding our souls. Everybody take a deep breath. You know what's happening inside is your lungs are expanding, right? You know, now let it out. You just feel better after you do that sort of thing. There's all kinds of research into that sort of thing. And so it is with generosity when we give away, because it has a way of saying, I trust God. God. I trust God with my resources. I'm willing to put my money where my mouth is. And on the other side of that, stinginess has a way of shrinking our souls. Have you ever had the opportunity to know someone who was stingy over time? There's almost a downward decline as they get crankier and they get stingier. And and basically they're saying, this is the resource I have to have in all of that. And so I want to talk a little bit about the spiritual part of this. Uh, Next slide. So if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me uh, to Luke chapter 21, 1 through 4, uh, a story called The Widow's Might. And and I really like this one uh, because it really speaks, I think, to the heart of of the issue in in giving. So give you a little context. Jesus has been kind of talking about money for a couple of chapters. He he talked about Zacchaeus. Y'all remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was in the tree. He was a rich man. And, and he, you know, came to Christ and that kind of changed the way he did his finances. Um, there, there's the parable of the talents that, that's in there and teaching on taxes. Anybody love paying taxes? So here, here if, if nothing else, giving to the kingdom of God has got to be better than paying taxes. Amen? Okay, good. Just, just wanted to make sure we're, we're on that. that. So, um, so the, let me show you what's going to happen. In the temple courts, uh, the places where they would give money in Jesus' time looked something like that. They had kind of a trumpet shape. We're not exactly sure. They would be scattered around this area called the Court of the Women or the Treasury. Uh, so people would come in uh, and give. And, and we think the context for this is probably a time when there would have been a lot of people uh, going on. And so you can imagine what it's like. This is metal. And money in those days was metal. And, and so if somebody gave a lot of money they would pour it in there, and you'd hear this clanging, clang, 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 right? So it was really great. It was kind of rewarding people who give a lot of money, because everybody would look up and go, wow, look at all the money they give. They must be really, really rich, right? Now, I'm not comfortable with that idea, but that's exactly what would happen in all of that. So that's kind of the context. Let's, let's read now the story. Um, next slide. As Jesus w- uh, looked up, he saw the rich putting in their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Next slide. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Well, that makes no sense. I mean, I'm not a genius with math, but two copper coins doesn't add up to what all that other stuff does. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on in that. Now, the first thing you're all thinking about that is, Pastor, are you supposed to say we're supposed to give everything we have to the church? No. 
Take a breath, you're all, yeah. that's not what, what it's saying there. Absolutely not, not the point of the story. Here's what the point of the story is and what I'm really trying to say is, next slide, we are to give everything we have to God, including our money. Amen. Everything we have, we give to God. It's what it means to say Jesus is Lord of our lives, that he is Lord of everything, and that includes our money. And for some, I know there's some anxiety, but, but what if God doesn't take care of me? Think about that for just a minute. What are the chances that the God of the universe, who literally came in Jesus Christ and died on the cross for all of your sins, is not going to take care of you? Zero. You're all still looking at me like you're concerned about all of this, okay? It, 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 the, the beautiful part of this is, is that, uh, that, that Christ is the one who gives us everything. Christ is the one that gave you the money to begin with, amen? Amen. Gave you the ability to, to deal with, uh, with all of that. So get the idea of what's going on now. Get that picture. Turn your imagination. And Jesus is in the, the court there, or the treasury area, or the court of women, whatever you want to call it. And, and there's this clanging going on from time to time. Someone dumps a whole bunch of money in. Everybody looks up. Ooh, what a, what a rich person. I'm not sure that's what got Jesus' attention because that happened. But somewhere in there, there was a clanging. I imagine the rich person went before and clang, 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 you know. And if they want to show off, you're going to move around so every, every coin clangs, right? You know, make a big ruggus. And then after that, there was this little tick, tick, as two very small copper coins dropped in from this woman. And you can imagine, probably most people couldn't even hear them if they were very far away. And you can see people thinking, did she, did she put anything in there? Does it, what, did she just come doing a show? Or what, what, what's the deal with all, all of that? And that's where Jesus steps in in, in, in that moment and, and, and said, you, you, you all have misunderstood money. You see, money is not our hope. Jesus is. Amen. He, you know, we, the tendency, the, the difficulty, the temptation of money is that we begin to put our trust in money, right? And so let's be honest. I'm just going to tell you where I live in all of this. I find it considerably easier to trust God when the bank account is full. Amen. Right? <laughs> but, you know, we're all in, it's just a natural part of it. And it's just kind of this thing. And this story is kind of working a, against all of that, okay? When we give God everything, he is more than enough. That's what the story kind of says. She's put in her last, last two coins, which weren't worth very much at all. Uh, and, and, and she's got to trust God at, at this point. And God would come in in all of this. When you give to God everything, it's more than enough. I learned this when I was in seminary. Now, I grew up in the church. My wife grew up in the church. All of our lives, we have tithed. When I made my first dollar, my dad said, okay, 10 cents goes in, you know, and, and that period in my wife. So it was, no, it was not hard for us when we got married to say 10% goes, goes to the kingdom of God, goes to the, the church and, and how that works. That worked out pretty good at first because we had good jobs and it, it was wonderful. Uh, and then God said, hey, Craig, I want you to pack up everything, move to Kansas City, felt like the Beverly Hillbillies, and go to seminary, Okay. So we went to seminary, but the wage scales were very, very different. And so I took a job in the grocery business, but it wasn't making nearly as I was on the West Coast, right? And, and, and she was in a spot where our, we had a kid and, you know, cost of childcare and all that. So the best economic thing for her was to kind of open a daycare uh, in, in, our, in our home, which didn't provide a lot of money, but the exchange was kind of there. And, and so as a result of that, we kind of dropped way low in terms of our, our, give, our, our earnings. But we were committed from the beginning that there was no, no debate about this sort of issue. We would give 10% to God and to the kingdom through, through the church because that's just what God had laid on us that we believe that was kind of the teaching uh, of, of all of that. And so we did that. It wasn't until years later when we happened to be reflecting back on this time in our life where we realized we would have qualified for all kinds of government aid. And it dawned on us, hey, we were poor. <laughs> you know? I can tell you something. Somehow, God worked it out. We never had a late payment on anything. We never missed a meal, as you can tell. <laughs> God just provided in a kind of ways I don't understand because the math didn't really work, but God moved in a powerful sort of way, and that cemented our conviction that God is faithful. 
even in our finances, all of that. God has always been faithful. God has always been enough. And in the, the end of the story is I ended up graduating seminary with a lot less debt than the people around me. I don't know how that works. I don't. But I've seen it over and over again. So here's what I know. Next slide. What we do with our money is a spiritual issue. Amen. Okay, there's the finances part of it. And I encourage you to be... Uh, to be faithful with your finances, provide for your retirement, do all the save. My dad used to say, you gotta spend less than you make. Okay, great principle, all of that. But at the end of the day, there's a spiritual part of this. And giving away money is a constant reminder that we trust God, not money. There's a discipline in that. We test him to provide and, and, and protect us. And you learn that in the deepest, darkest moments when it seems like it's, it's the hardest. When it, you, all you got is two copper coins. That's all you got. Oh, might as well put it in, you know. Th- th- that's where we learn this. So giving away money has a way of working to free us from the grip of greed. Amen. <laughs> Pastor's given up preaching and gone to meddling, you know of hoarding, of thinking that this is where our thing is. Here, here's, you have to think about this for a minute. God is richer than Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and every tech billionaire in the entire world combined. Amen. Pretty sure he can take care of you. Now, I'm not saying you're going to be rich, okay? I do not believe in the prosperity gospel. Give more and you'll have more, and if you just give enough to the church, you'll be rich. That is that's evil, in my opinion. That's using God's name for things other than what God wants to do. But I am telling you, God is faithful. Say, God is faithful. Okay, next slide. You can't accept the new thing God wants to do if your hands are still full of the old thing. So um, I arrive here very early on Sunday mornings, about 4.30 in the morning, and uh, I have my briefcase with all the stuff in it, you know, my computer and all of that. And because it's 4.30 in the morning, I have a very large cup of coffee, okay, that I bring in. And then, as it turns out, there are things I have to do. I, I took the van this week to get the, the t- work and witness team, so I had the thing that all that, that paperwork's in there. And I'm kind of coming up to the door, which, of course, is always locked at that point. And I'm, like, trying to, to move this over to the other hand. And I've done it dozens of times, and every time I spill coffee on myself, which is very hot, because I picked it up on the way here, right? Because I got to dig in and get my keys and do the thing. And this morning, as way of illustration, the Lord said, why don't you set something down? <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Because <laughs> then I could handle all that stuff. And I think there is this principle um, that, that, that when you give something away, it has a way of clearing you up to receive more from God. And again, you're not, you're not going to get rich in all of that, but there's something about that that, that happens, that, that you, you give it away and, and it has a way of changing your heart and it has a way of opening up possibilities. G- giving away money develops empathy and creates a compassionate heart. I'm just telling you, in so many ways it does that. Giving away money gives you skin in the game. Um, after we got out of seminary, we, we took a church in what we called urban, probably most of you would call it inner city, uh, rough community. Um, and across the street, kind of kitty corner from us, was a house that had all kinds of things going, middle of the night, and all of that sort of stuff. There's a family in there, and they had a, a boy, that, a couple of boys that were the same age as my son, and so they kind of developed a friendship. And um, we knew that there was lots of trouble in that place. The cops would show up semi-regularly at that, at that house. And uh, as we were getting close to Christmas one year, um, the boy told my son that they weren't going to have Christmas that year, that it had kind of been canceled for them. And for Jody and I, that kind of broke our hearts because there were several kids in there. And we kind of talked about it and prayed about it and just felt like the Lord was leading us to, to give them a couple hundred bucks to, to make the thing. And so I went over there. I tried to do it really close to Christmas so it couldn't go other places, you know. Uh, and went to the door, knocked, and said, hey... Um, we heard that you're not going to have Christmas this year, and we want the kids to have Christmas. And I, we gave them, I think, 200 bucks, which was a lot of money in our world, but not the end of the world by any stretch of the imagination. And she cried, you know, and thanked us. And I said, I need you to go do this right away because I didn't want it to go to drugs or any, anything like that. And we walked back. Can I tell you, in all of my life, I have never been so satisfied and happy to spend $200 is that day. It was 
something powerful. And the, the kids, I said, don't tell the kids that we did this for you. This comes from you. And Christmas morning, the kids are over there over with, hey, we got this really cool stuff. We had a great Christmas. We didn't think we were going to have any Christmas. And we had this great Christmas. And of course, we hadn't told our kids. And so we're just smiling and like, yeah, God is good. God, God is, is really good. That family didn't know Jesus. In fact, part of the connection to that family was a couple of times I went and bailed them out of jail. Um, kind of a deal. Uh, and then, of course, we, we moved on. They visited our church a couple of times, but, but you know, that, they weren't really at that stage. A um, number of years later, we uh, heard back from them. We connected from them. And out of three or four kids, two of them were followers of Jesus. Amen. I thought, best 200 bucks I ever spent in my life, Amen. So I, I am telling you, there's something about that. There's something about that when you, when you let go of the $200. God blessed us in so many ways, and God has always been, been faithful for us. And so I just want to encourage you, there's something powerful about this idea uh, of giving. And, and so, um, next slide. The story of the widow's might asks the question, do you trust God with your money? Do you trust God with your money? Do you trust God? I can do this all day long. Do you trust God with your money? Yes. Man, yes, that, that's the heart of, of, of this issue. Who do you, you trust in, in, in that? And I've, I've gone on this journey with a number of people over the years. I had a really good friend uh, right out of uh, college. I uh, was working and, and going to this church we loved and young families. And this, this friend of mine uh, that I got to know at that church had only been a Christian a couple of years. Uh, but we had got, become really good friends. And, and he, one day he said to me, he said, I just feel like the Lord's talking to me about tithing. And like, I mean like 10% tithing. I, I don't, you know, and most people don't jump straight to 10% kind of a thing. And so we talked back and forth. And, and finally, I just said to him one day, I said, Jeff, I think you just need to try it. Try it for a month. See what happens. A month later, he comes back to me. He says, you're not going to believe this. And at the time, I probably wouldn't have. He said, we didn't get any extra money, no raises, nothing else came in. But at the end of the month, we had more than what we had before. I don't understand that math. And I still don't understand that math. And I've watched a couple of you who are into that kind of money going, yeah, that's right. You don't understand that math either. But God has a way of doing that. Amen? He went on to tithes for the, the well, to this day, he still is a, is a part of that. So the question is, do you really believe that if you are faithful to God, he will be faithful to you? And the answer is yes. I think money is the hardest place for some of us. It's that final stronghold because there's, there's risk involved in this. If God doesn't come through, then all is going to be lost. And the truth of the matter is, having been in ministry now a long time, I've heard Jeff's story many, 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 many times. I've had people sit in my desk and say, you know, Pastor, we started giving. You kind of challenged us, and we gave a little more than we really thought we could, and we thought it wasn't going to work out. And You're not going to believe what happened. And I want to, but I don't go, oh yeah, I'll believe. I've heard it before. This is just casual stuff. You know, that's the way God works. And they'll say, we had more money left over than before. It was not like a whole lot of money, but we just, we just had more. There's a great verse I want to share with you. Psalms 37, it says, I was young and now I am old. I think that's why I identify with this. Because... <laughs> I used to be young and now I'm old. My 40th reunion was this week, so I was, I was looking at the pictures on Facebook of all of my friends and it's like, they're old. How did my friends become old? I'm not old, am I? You know? And they're like, yeah, you are. <laughs> okay, sorry, sidetrack. I was young and now I'm old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. I can say that's true. I have watched over and over and over again as people have been faithful to God, God is faithful to them. Thousands of years ago, they were still struggling with this issue. So if you're struggling with it, welcome to the club. But I'm here to tell you, I was young and now I am old and I have watched for a long time, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. This is such an important part of it in our lives because it's, it's a spiritual issue. It's about God and where his place is. I, uh, I went to NNU, which is where this is at, and NNU has a, a scripture motto, uh, Matthew 6, is what it is. And when I was in college, I didn't think a whole lot of it. I thought, you know, okay, that's, that's kind of good. I hadn't really applied it to money or any of that sort of thing. And we had a, um, a, a president who just said it over and over again, and he had a bit of an accent. So this is what it, what, what it says. 
but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And I say it like that pretty well because I mocked him a lot when I was in college, <laughs> as did everybody. And there was a fool between him and I, but it wasn't him. Because I have come to know that when you seek first the kingdom of God, he takes care of the rest. There's something powerful in, in, in our lives. There's great joy in, in giving. So next slide, I'm hurrying quickly through here. God's financial goal for you is not riches, but generosity. Amen. Say generosity. generosity. This is just so important, and it's so much fun to be generous. But let me give you kind of my definition of generosity. Next slide. Generosity is giving until it pinches. Not, 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 a, not giving everything to the church and praying, oh, Lord, come and rescue me. You know, he's going to say, I did. I gave you the money. What are you doing? You know, but until it pinches, until, until it, it, it binds a, a, a little bit. You know, let's be honest. A few bucks to a homeless person, for most of us, that is not pinching. In fact, you're maybe paying more for your coffee than for a few bucks to them. This is something bigger than that, something where God opens the opportunity, both in terms of disciplined giving and in terms of opportunities. One of the things I have loved about being a follower of Jesus is over the years, God has opened the doors for us to give something or some amount of money to people. And it's, I'm not going to share those with you. The one I told you is the one I use for preaching because the Bible talks about losing your reward. And I want my reward when I get to heaven, okay? <laughs> But I'm telling you, generosity is joyous. It's, it's so powerful. Give until it, it, it pinches just a little bit. Um, next slide. I've been kind of saying this one. Generosity is life-giving. It, it just gives life to all that we do. We're going to talk about volunteering next week. and that You're going to see the life that that gives to them. The same is true uh, with, our, with our resources when we're, when we're generous. And it's a great witness to the world around us. And, and give, it gives life to the person who is generous. There's, and there's lots of research. I was kind of looking up some of this. People who are generous have higher levels of life satisfaction, higher levels of happiness, and higher levels of self-esteem. That's a pretty good return on investment, just right there with the rest of it. it there's just something about this. Um, Proverbs 11:25. next slide. Um, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed, okay? And I don't, you're not going to get rich, okay? That's not what this is about. This is about serving what God would, would have us uh, to do in our lives. So um, three reasons to give to the body of Christ, real quickly. Number one, the church relies on your giving to make church happen. That's just the bottom line. We have what you give. Number two, the giving is a critical component of your spiritual growth and health. And this is where some people stop growing spiritually because the money issue is something that's like, oh, I don't know if I want to give that to God. Don't wrestle with God, okay? It never works out well. Next slide. The church of Jesus Christ is the best investment you can make with your money. Amen. There is no other place you can invest dollars and cents and see changed eternal destinies and changed lives in the world uh, around you. It's the most powerful thing you can possibly imagine. And then sometimes I think in a middle-class church like this, it's harder for us to see that because sometimes they, they kind of got their life together, but something happens and then they become followers of Jesus and, and life moves on. But like I said, I used to pastor in a place where people were pretty rough. And I think I've told you this story before. The, the importance of giving is just so much a part of that. As I was getting towards the end of my ministry and God was beginning to move and I was fighting with God about whether I should move and I didn't want to leave my church and all of that. One day I, I was in the back and they were, they were playing and that place rocked the house. Again, heavily influenced by the black church at that time. And um, as I was in the back, I, I saw this couple back there that were raising their hands that had recently been married. And I just started to cry because I'd pastored long enough to remember when he was a drug dealer and she was a hooker. And one day they met Jesus and their lives were radically changed. And then Jesus gave them each other. And I'm telling you, the change was so amazing with him. One day he came to me and he, he was talking about the joy of, of following Jesus. He said, pastor, you're not gonna believe this. And he must have been in his late 30s, 40s somewhere, he said, for the very first time in my life, 
I've earned a vacation. I've been at the job long enough. I get a paid vacation of two weeks. Isn't that great? I said, yes, we're so excited for you. I said, what are you going to do for it? During that time, his face kind of fell. He said, well, um, I did some things I shouldn't do, and I need to go to jail for two weeks, and so I'm going to surrender myself and spend my first vacation in jail. And in some ways, that's sad, and in some ways, that's astounding. He had been so transformed that he decided he needed to take the consequences for what he had done before. And I said, that is so wonderful because when you come out, you're clean, you're done. It's a whole new world for you. There is no place you can invest dollars that will create that kind of change except the church of Jesus Christ, amen? Best investment you can possibly make. Okay, got to rush on. How to give. Number one, you can give in our give boxes at the back. You can put uh, checks in there. You can put cash in there. We'll take that as well. Next slide. You can give on our Generations app. At the bottom, you'll see a little heart, uh, and you just click on that, and you fill in the information, and you can give. That's one of the easiest ways to give. Next slide. You can give on our webpage. You'll see the give button up there. You click on there. Same thing. Fill out the information. There's markdowns for all the different places you can give. Uh, You can put it in the mail and and mail it to us. In fact, not only can you write a check and mail it, a lot of you have banks where you can actually set it up so if you get paid the same amount, you can just have your check, uh, your bank automatically send a check to the church. We have a number of people uh, that do that. You can also do a recurring gift, which is where you set it up uh, with with our our system, basically, where they'll uh, withdraw the same amount every every month on this. So here's my goal, real quickly. My goal is 100% giving. My goal is not a financial goal, how much money we're going to raise. My goal is that everyone in our church would experience the blessing of generosity and giving to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. The family units, that that, that would be the, the thing that just for everybody. And, and I apologize. I finally, I found a really great closing illustration too late to actually pull it off. So turn on your imaginations for a minute. What I was going to do was I was going to go to the bank and get a whole bunch of roll of pennies. And I was going to give every one of you two pennies, two coins to remind you it's not about how much you give. It's about being faithful to what God has called you to do, okay? Some of you can give more. when It take more for it to pinch. Some of you, a couple of coins is going to pinch in all of that. But it is that our heart is for God and we say, I trust God. Amen. Say, I trust God. I trust God. One more time. Amen. Let me pray for you. If our musicians would come, we're going to sing. Sorry, I got wrapped up and I didn't tell them that. Father God, Lord, (laughs) sermons about money always feel awkward. I I just feel like I'm, you know, begging for money. And that is really not what scripture teaches, Father. You teach that this is a, a way for you to bless us, Father, if we'll let go and we'll trust you with what you've given to us, Father. And I know that within our congregation, there's some folks that feel like, yep, they're like that widow. They don't have anything to give, Father. I I just pray that maybe it's just two pennies. Maybe it's just a dime. Whatever it is, Father, that we would give. And for those of us that have larger resources, Father, that you would uh, encourage us to give. Lord, when we say it's important to trust God in our finances, we mean that as a church as well. Father, I know that there's probably some cutbacks coming because of the decline in giving that's come post-COVID and gotten a little worse in our church lately. But Father, we trust you. We trust you to give us what we need we, we promise to you that we will be faithful with everything you put in our hands, Father, that your kingdom might be expanded and that the disciples might be raised up for the glory of your name. And we ask this in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's sing together. Hey, church family. Thank you so much for watching this video. We hope that God is inspiring you and working in your life. If so, make sure you send this video to a friend so that they can be impacted by the good news of the gospel as well. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss a single video. And as always, we hope that God is continuing to work and move in your life. Thanks again for watching. God bless.